Plessis versus Ferguson is a landmark 1896 United States Supreme Court decision which upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine. Plessy versus Ferguson is widely regarded as one of the worst decisions in United States Supreme Court history, but despite its infamy, the decision was never explicitly overturned. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can check out more content like this at onemichistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at my Patreon or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. During Reconstruction, Southern African Americans saw promises of equality with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution, only to return to disenfranchisement and white supremacy across the South. After the Compromise of 1877, which led to federal troops being removed from the South, Democrats consolidated control of state legislatures across the regions and effectively marked the end of Reconstruction, and white Southerners were allowed to subjugate African Americans again without federal interference. As African Americans witnessed the dawn of Jim Crow, the Louisiana state government passed the Separate Car Law in 1890. It stipulated that all passenger railway companies had to provide separate cars for white and black Americans. These separate cars should be equal in facilities. If a passenger insisted on going into the coach or compartment for which the race he did not belong, he shall be liable to a $25 fine or imprisonment for a period of no more than 20 days. Members of the black community in New Orleans decided to mount a resistance and form the Committee of Citizens. They were dedicated to the repeal of the law or at least fighting the effects of the law. The committee persuaded a 34-year-old man by the name of Homer Plessy to participate in the orchestration of testing the law. Plessy was born a freedman and was one-eighth black. However, under Louisiana law, he was classified as black and required to sit in the colored car. On June 7, 1892, Plessy bought a first-class ticket and boarded the white-only car on the East Louisiana Railroad from New Orleans bound for Covington, Louisiana. The East Louisiana Railroad Company actually opposed the law because it required them to purchase more railway cars. They actually intended on challenging the law, but the committee of citizens were unaware of this and proceeded with their own plan. They also hired a private detective with arresting powers so he could detain Homer Plessy and ensure that he was charged with violating the Separate Car Act and not some other offense. After Homer Plessy took his seat in the white-only car, he was asked to vacate and sit in the black-only car. Of course, he refused and was immediately arrested by the detective. During the trial of Homer Plessy versus the state of Louisiana, Homer Plessy's lawyers argued that the state law requiring the segregation of the Eastern Louisiana Railroad denied him his rights under the 13th and 14th Amendment, which provided for equal treatment under the law. However, Judge Howard Ferguson ruled that Louisiana had the right to regulate railroad companies while they operated within Louisiana boundaries. Thus, Plessy was convicted and sentenced to a $25 fine. Undeterred, the Committee of Citizens took Plessy's appeal to the Louisiana Supreme Court in 1892 where the Supreme Court would uphold Judge Ferguson's ruling. When the court spoke on their decision in the Ferguson judgment, they stated that the judgment did not violate the 14th Amendment. Judge Charge Finner cited a number of precedents in two key cases in northern states. In Massachusetts, the state Supreme Court ruled that in 1849 that segregated schools were constitutional. The Massachusetts court stated that this prejudice, if it exists, it's not created by law, thus cannot be changed by law. In a similar case in Pennsylvania, the law also mandated separate cars for different races. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court in their judgment stated that to assert the separateness is not to inherently declare inferiority. It's simply to state that in order of divine providence, human authority ought not compelled the two widely separate races to intermix. Undeterred again. The Committee of Citizens appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Oral arguments would begin April 13, 1896, 
Avalon W. Torich and Samuel S. Phillips appeared in the court on behalf of Homer Plessy. Homer Plessy's lawyers once again built their case on the violation of Plessy's right under the 13th and 14th Amendment. Turek argued that the reputation of a black man was that of property, and as such, it implied the inferiority of African Americans in comparison to whites. Arguing for the state was the Attorney General of Louisiana, Milton Joseph Cunningham. Cunningham argued that the Supreme Court had no right to overturn a ruling that was proper and correct. He also reiterated that the two lower courts did not see any violation of the 13th and 14th Amendment and concluded stating that the operation of passengers may be solely on the grounds of race or color is a reasonable regulation, provided accommodations are equal in quality and conveniences are furnished for both alike. The 14th Amendment is only a violation in states where the regulation is an attempt to establish an inequality in respect to the enjoyments of those rights and privileges. On May 18, 1896, the Supreme Court issued a 7-1 verdict in the Plessy v. Ferguson case. They declared that separate but equal facilities constitutional on intrastate railroads upholding the constitutionality of the Louisiana train car segregation laws. In his ruling, the court dismissed any claim that the Louisiana car law violated the 13th Amendment, which in its opinion, the 13th Amendment did no more than ensure the African Americans the basic level of legal rights to abolish slavery. Next, the court considered the law violating the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The court concluded that although the 14th Amendment was meant to guarantee legal protection of all races in America, it was not intended to prevent social and other types of discrimination. Basically, the 14th Amendment only applied to political and civil rights and not social rights. Judge Henry Brown wrote, we consider the underlying fallacy of Plessy's argument to consist in the assumption that the enforcement of segregation of the two races stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. If it be so, it's not for any other reason found in the act, but solely because the colored race chooses to put that construct upon it. Judge John Marshall Harlan was the lone dissenter in this opinion. Harlan strongly disagreed with the court's conclusion that the Louisiana law did not imply the inferiority of African Americans and accused his other justices of being willfully ignorant on the subject. John Marshall Harlan stated that everyone understood the purpose of the law and that it was not to exclude white people from train cars being occupied by blacks, but to exclude black people from coaches being occupied by whites. Harlan also pointed out that the Louisiana law contained an exception for nurses attending to children of another race. In this idea, that a black woman who was nannies to a white children could be in the white only car. According to Harlan, this showed that a black person could be in the white only car if it was obvious that they were a domestic. Harlan also argued that many whites considered themselves superior to all of the Americans, but the U.S. Constitution was colorblind in matters of law and civil rights. The white race deems itself the dominant race in this country, if so in prestige, in achievements, education, wealth, power. But in the view of the Constitution, in the lives of the law, in this country, there is no superior dominant ruling class. There is no caste system here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither nor tolerates classes among the citizens. In respect to civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law and the humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards a man as a man and makes no account of his surroundings or his color or when his civil rights are guaranteed by the supreme law and his land are involved. In the aftermath, Plessy legitimized state laws establishing racial segregation in the South and legitimized other laws that required racial segregation in America. The effect of the Plessy's ruling was immediate. There were already significant differences in funding for segregated schools. This would continue into the 20th century and states consistently underfunded black schools, providing them with substandard buildings, textbooks and supplies. States that were successfully integrated would abruptly adopt oppressive segregation legislation. Jim Crow laws and practices would establish segregated education facilities, hotels, restaurants, and even separate beaches. 
The major issue was that if separate facilities weren't equal, states faced no consequences if they underfunded facilities or services for non-whites. And because of the vague declaration of separate but equal was issued after the Plessy decision and that no state actually wrote separate but equal doctrine into their statutes, there was no remedy other than to go back to the Supreme Court. In 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Later, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would prohibit legal segregation, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 would provide federal oversight in the enforcement of voter registration and voting. With these laws and Supreme Court decisions, Plessy v. Ferguson was de facto overturned, and although it was not explicitly overturned by the Supreme Court, it is effectively dead as a president. In 2009, Keith Plessy and Phoebe Ferguson, descendants of the participants on both sides of the 1896 Supreme Court case, announced the establishment of the Plessy v. Ferguson Foundation for Education and Reconsolidation. The foundation would work to create new ways to teach the history of civil rights through film, art, and public programs designed to create understanding for the historic case and its effect on America. Thank you. I'm Country Boy. This has been One Mike Black History. If you like more stories like this, you can find more at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so at my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Lastly, please give me five stars on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Peace.